Bitcoin and Co. The podcast about crypto economy and the future of money. Hosted by author and speaker Anita Posch. Hello and welcome to this episode of my Bitcoin and Co. podcast. I'm glad that you're listening and if you like my show then please support it. I'm an independent creator of educational content like this podcast and therefore sponsorships and your support are very important for me. What you can do is you can share the show on social media, tip me in Bitcoin or become a patron. With as little as $5 per month you'll get early access to new episodes and a big thank you. Go to patreon.com forward slash Anita Posh. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash A-N-I-T-A-P-O-S-C-H. Thank you. And now let's start with this episode. Hello, dear listeners. Our guest today is Pamela Morgan. Pamela is an educator, attorney, and entrepreneur. She has studied business and computer programming before pursuing a Juris Doctor's degree. In early 2015, Pamela has founded Third Key Solutions, a key consulting firm that works with individuals and organizations to improve the security of their crypto holdings and ensure these assets are accessible in the event of crisis, death, or disaster. The CTO of Third Key Solutions is Andreas Antonopoulos, as you might know, one of the most well-known and well-respected figures in Bitcoin. And by the way, you should listen to him in my Bitcoin podcast episode 4. Pamela is also the author of Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning, a simple guide for owners. And in the next minutes, we are going to talk about some of the core takeaways of her book and a little bit about her personal story regarding Bitcoin and entrepreneurship. So hello, Pamela. Hello, Anita. Hi, it's great to talk with you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to to have our chat. Yes, me too. Thanks. Um, When I read your biography, uh, it seems that you're a kind of a Renaissance person with many interests and a wide area of knowledge. How did that come about? Please tell us a bit about your journey and uh, until the work you are doing now. I'd love to. Um, You know, I, I, like many people, heard about Bitcoin for the first time kind of by accident. So uh, a little bit of my history before Bitcoin... Uh, As you mentioned, uh, my degree is in computer programming and business administration. And then I went to law school and I started working as a lawyer, but I always knew that I wanted to teach college. Teaching is fantastic. Uh, It's, I think, teaching people how to improve their lives is one of the greatest callings that a, that a human being can have. And so I started, I, after practicing law, I decided that I was going to start teaching college and I did that. And in my journey of teaching college, I was a speaker for entrepreneurship, and I ended up speaking at a conference called Disrupt Startup Scale Up, and that was held in Athens, Greece in late 2013, and I was there as a speaker talking about, as I said, entrepreneurship and um, and sort of how how people can change their lives, and I was really excited about this conference because it was called, as I said, Disrupt Startup Scale Up. And I was really excited about disrupting the status quo. And as I was sitting in the audience, listening to speaker after speaker after speaker, I became more and more disillusioned. I became more and more bored, I (laughs) guess is the word I'll use, because the things that the speakers were talking about weren't to me they weren't disruptive at all Uh it it seemed to me that it was really a lot of the status quo Mm -hmm. and then a speaker came and took the stage and everyone in the audience was was moved and that speaker it was andreas antonopoulos (laughs) and he was speaking about bitcoin Mm -hmm. and that was my first anything i i didn't i hadn't even heard the word bitcoin Um, Or at least I didn't remember ever hearing the word Bitcoin. And when he was on stage and and he was speaking about the promise of Bitcoin and how it could impact humanity. And I remember sitting in my chair thinking, 
if half of what this guy says is true, this thing might actually change the world and I want to know more about it. So after that event, I went home and like so many people do when they get, you know, the Bitcoin bug, I started researching and I started reading everything I could about it. And the more that I read, the more convinced that I became that this had a lot of potential. And so about two months later, I quit my full-time job and I decided that I was going to make a career for myself in, in Bitcoin, that I wanted to be a part of this. And that's what I've done. Okay, so so then you you quitted your job and started uh, to be an entrepreneur by yourself. Yeah. So, so what happened was I I left my full time position, and because I'm for I'm fortunate that I'm a lawyer, mm -hmm. and so what that means at least in the U.S. is I can practice law in Michigan and Illinois, the states that I'm licensed in, uh, without anyone's permission. I don't need to do anything because I already have the credentials. I've already passed the bar and been, and been admitted. So what I decided to do was start practicing law uh, for Bitcoin companies. So I was helping a lot of startups. At mm -hmm. the time, um, there were a lot of people that were starting new businesses in Bitcoin and they needed help, you know, just with regular business organization stuff. Like, do I choose and what structure, you know, do I choose a partnership or an LLC or, what, you know, how do I structure my business and kind of more mundane day to day things, but they needed help. Um, and so I started helping them. And then I ran into this, what I think is a really interesting problem and opportunity, which is a lot of these entrepreneurs were uh, were getting funding in Bitcoin. And at the time, multi-sig, while it was a feature of, of the platform, it wasn't actually implemented in any wallets. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to use multi-sig, you had to do a lot of different things. But I was so excited about the promise of multi-sig because it stops one person from running away with all the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so at that time in early 2014, there were a lot of stories about people raising money in Bitcoin and then either they would get hacked or the one of the principals of the company would mysteriously run away with all the money. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, why aren't we using multisig? You know, like the, the, the technology is there. We should be doing this. And nobody was doing it. So I started helping my clients implement multi-sig as part of an overall kind of um, legal advice sort of thing that I would do. And I didn't have the technical acumen for that. So I started reaching out to people, smart people that I knew in the industry that I had met and asking them if they would help me to design multi-sig um, solutions. And I was fortunate that Andreas was interested enough in the work that I was doing and offered to help. And so with his help and the help of a number of other people, uh, I was able to kind of design these multi-sig governance processes that were put into place by a lot of uh, early companies. And those processes are continuing to, to be used today. Okay. And that's kind of how Third Key Solutions came to be. I understand. Okay. Uh, maybe, yeah. Can you please, um, um, in a short form, explain what, what multisig is? Because uh, many listeners might not know what it is. Absolutely. And I'll try to do it in a short form. Yeah. Although I'm a lawyer <laughs> and a teacher. <laughs> we're, so. we're, we're going to talk <laughs> about it later on, maybe again. So, yeah. Yeah, of course. So, multi signature is exactly what you might think it is. What it means is you need more than one signature to unlock funds. So in the U.S., you can put money in a, a joint bank account. And in the U.S., typically with a joint bank account, either person can withdraw money. So you only need one signature. Even though it, the, the account belongs to two people, you would only need one signature. There are more sophisticated accounts. And when I say accounts, I'm talking about like regular banking where you can have them set up multi-signature, where you would need two signatures on a check, for example, for it to be valid. What's cool about Bitcoin and other programmatic money is that instead of having a check that has you know, two lines on it that you have to sign, you actually can lock up funds in a way that you can't withdraw them without more than one signature. And why that matters is because it's a really powerful tool 
because when you give money to people, some of them will run away with it. <laughs> yeah. It's it's the law of nature. <laughs> it's how people function. Mm-hmm. Um, for your listeners who might not know, I, I, I'm a lawyer and we have in the U.S., we have bar journals, which is basically every month the the state bar that I'm a member of has a, a magazine and in it it has articles about you know things that matter to lawyers and whatever but the best part of the bar journal is always the back three pages and the reason is because that's where all the lawyer discipline notices come out so when lawyers do naughty things and they get punished by the bar association, those are generally, when they're public, they're published at the back of the bar journal. Oh. And so, yeah, so you can take this magazine and look in the back. And if you do, you will find that repeatedly there are problems with lawyers holding client funds where a a client gives money for a retainer, right? I want to hire you as my lawyer. Here's $5,000. And the lawyer is supposed to work against that retainer, um, but not take the money until they've actually earned it, right? So they're supposed to put it in the U.S. They're supposed to put it in a separate account Uh and hold it for the benefit of their client. Well, you might imagine that that doesn't always happen. And <laughs> but, so, but they are lawyers. The, I mean, they should, <laughs> but they don't. They just run away they, with it. All. I mean, that's what it is, right? And often it's not, you know, it's not malice. They're not, often the lawyers don't say, well, I'm going to steal my client's money. Yeah. No, what happens is, you know, they have a big payment coming up. Maybe, you Mm -hmm. know, maybe they buy a new house or maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, their, their rent in their office space is due and they have a cash flow problem because other clients haven't paid them Mm -hmm. and they think they're going to get paid. So they just want to borrow, right? They just want to borrow from these funds. And then what happens is, you know, generally a snowball effect happens Mm -hmm. and they borrow, but they can't actually pay it back and you run into problems. So anyway. All of that to say, to go back to your question about multisig, the reason that I think that multi-signature is interesting is because, for example, when a client, when a lawyer takes client funds with, with Bitcoin, we can create an account from our phones in five minutes or less that locks those funds into an account where the lawyer knows they're there, the client knows they're there, mm-hmm. but you need the lawyer and the client together in order to spend any of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's cool because it changes the dynamic. You're changing custody and you're, and you're basically going from don't be evil. Don't take your client's money to can't be evil because you've locked the funds in a way that the lawyer can't actually take the money out without the client's consent. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, but on the other hand, we hear, hear a lot of stories of people who have lost uh, their bitcoins or who have been hacked or other things. Uh, what are, in your experience, the most common mistakes people do when they are storing their crypto assets? That's a great question. So, you know, even though multi-signature has been out for a while, it still isn't, in, it still isn't implemented in a lot of wallets. So you actually have to kind of go and seek out multi-signature. Um, you're not just going to find it on, on the wallets that people are using every day. So one of the problems, A, the number one reason why people lose funds in, in this way is because they don't actually back up their wallets. They don't complete the backup function. And so, for example, if someone has a, a wallet on their cell phone, And then their cell phone breaks or gets lost or stolen. They have no way to recover those funds because they haven't backed up their wallet. So that's the number one thing. Uh, Number two is when people do back up their wallet, but they either don't store the backup somewhere where they can find it, right? So they hide it because they're worried that people will find their backup somewhere. Or even worse, they cut it into pieces, So they try and and make themselves more secure by cutting their backup into pieces or separating it in some way that it's not intended to be separated. So Pamela, I found an article you wrote on Medium called Inheritance Planning for Cryptocurrencies, Three Steps in Three Minutes. Can you maybe, uh, in short, give us a description what people should do 
to um, be able that their heirs um, uh, can find the the funds and do something with it. I would love to. This is this is an issue that I've been focusing on for the past three years, and there's no end in sight. Um, if you own cryptocurrency, you have to do some sort of inheritance planning. Legal planning is not enough. Um, and so I wrote this article, you know, I, and I called it three steps in three minutes to kind of make it less scary. A lot of people, when they start thinking about doing inheritance planning, they think, Ooh, I don't want to do that. That sounds scary. I have to think about death. I have to think about things that I don't want to think about. Uh, so I tried to make this article accessible and easy to follow. So as I mentioned, there are three, there are three basic steps. One, your heirs have to know if you're keeping any funds on exchanges, on any exchanges. And th they need to know that because the exchange is not going to contact your heirs and tell them, hey, we heard, you know, that, that so-and-so passed away and we're holding money for them. Um, I'm doing a research project with exchanges all around the world, asking them questions about inheritance. For example, are they having people designate beneficiaries? What do they do if someone doesn't log into their account for five years, mm -hmm. six years, eight years? You know, do they have any way to contact these people? And it's very difficult. Most of the exchanges do not have and do not have clients uh, designate a beneficiary. They don't have an emergency contact. They don't have anyone to contact and say, hey, you know, this person hasn't accessed this account in five years, you know, is something wrong? Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, you know, is this person hodling or are they gone? Yeah. You know, do, yeah. they, do they lose access? And the exchanges don't know. So it's a, it's, you have to designate this. You have to tell your heirs about your exchange accounts in order for them to actually be able to access any funds there. Otherwise, those funds are just going to sit on the exchanges basically forever. Um, in the United States, there are laws about dormant accounts, meaning accounts that are untouched for a number mm -hmm. of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And different states have different laws. But some of them require that, for example, if you haven't accessed your account in seven years, then that value is actually transferred to the state. Oh, okay. So it's, yeah, <laughs> it can be really scary. Um, so it, it's, it's very, very important that, that your heirs know if you have exchange accounts. That said, you know, you, you don't necessarily, you don't have to give them your passwords. You don't have to give them your, your 2FA. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's enough for them to know that you have exchange accounts for most people. Yeah. So you the, mean the, the, the second, the, yeah, the, heirs, the heirs should know if I have funds on an exchange and, and uh, yes. just for the listeners, an exchange is basically a website or a kind of a, let's say bank where you can change your fiat currency like euros or US dollars to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And, and, and those exchanges, most of the times, hold the funds for me, so I don't have yes. the private key. And that's the problem. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly and, the and, problem. And therefore, we should all use our own wallets and make your, our own backups, right? Yes, absolutely. That's that's I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, yeah. that's, that's step two in your article. Yes. So hopefully uh, you won't be keeping money on exchanges. And if you're not keeping money on exchanges, then you get to skip the first one. So then you only have two things to tell your heirs. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> another benefit. Um, so if, if you're ready to move on to wallets, what you want to do, it's wallets are a bit trickier because as you mentioned, Anita, you know, with, with your own wallet, you're typically holding your own keys. And so what your heirs need to know is not what wallet software you're using per se, mm -hmm. but they need to have copies of your backups. They need to be able to access your backups to that wallet. Because what they're going to do when, when the time comes is they're going to access your wallet and hopefully move those coins to a new wallet that they've created and that they control. 
So it's very important that your that your heirs know where your backups are. That said, I do not recommend that you give your heirs your backups. Don't give it to them now. Uh, and the reason is because obviously, if they have your wallet backup, they have full access, and that puts them in a bad position. Either they they might make a bad decision to to spend your money, or you know if they have your backup at home maybe someone comes in and is visiting and mm-hmm. sees what that is and you know they don't know you but they have no problem with with taking the bitcoin so i don't recommend for most people that they give their loved ones copies of their backups so so in a perfect world if you have a good family relationship and you feel you know strongly that you know the people that that you give this information to you can trust then yes, you would want to tell them what software you're using and tell them where they can find the backups. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to give them that information now. What you can do is write a letter to them that they will find after you're gone Mm -hmm. that gives them all of this information. And so I've actually written a template to that letter and published it on Medium as well. And it, it, it literally says, like, it gives you all of the language that you need. It says, dear loved ones, if you're finding this letter, it's because I need you to know that I have cryptocurrency or crypto assets. Mm. Be careful because people can steal them from you. Here are the things you need to know. Blah, blah, blah. And so you would use that letter to, to, to or, I'm sorry, you would use that template to inform your heirs. Mm-hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes, and then I can, because I'm gone, (laughs) sadly, uh, then I can put it together. Yes, yes, then they'll be able to put it together. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I I touch on briefly in the the three minutes article, but that I touch on a lot more in the book, is the idea of designating helpers. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is people who will be there when you're not, who can help your heirs navigate all of this, <laughs> who can help them actually use the backups and securely and safely transfer your funds to wherever they need to go. Mm-hmm. So step one is actually letting them know that there mm-hmm. are some funds and where they are and where the backup is. And then yes. uh, to find people who are technically uh, as advanced as, as you have to be to be able to import the backup in a new wallet, etc. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And also, you want to make sure that I'm a big fan of having more than one helper. Mm. Um, if you can find, ideally, you'll have two different people who don't know each other who can help. Mm. And you you want them to be honest and trustworthy most of all they can always get people who are technically minded to help but you because these processes are irreversible because once you move crypto funds from one place to another you can't undo it it's very important to get it right the first time and so it's very important to have for your heirs to have a lot of oversight in that process Yeah, and um, I think also one of your ideas or tips is uh, regarding hardware wallets or the the, the devices. Mm. Do you know I what? love hardware wallets. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I love them because they give a lot more security than what most people can do on their own. So they provide a level of security that's unattainable for most people in an easy way. They have a nice, most of them have a, a nice user interface for our industry. Um, <laughs> maybe not ideal, but for our industry, it's nice. Um, and, you know, they're, they're relatively easy to use. A lot of them have good documentation. You know, Trezor uh, has excellent documentation on their website. Uh, Ledger has documentation as well. Uh, so, and a lot of other hardware wallets are building those up. So they'll have help. That, that's why it matters. So I'm a big fan of hardware wallets. Yeah, but um, what I, the idea which I wanted to ask you is the one with the picture. Because uh, in your article you say uh, most people don't know the difference between a USB drive and a hardware yes. wallet. Yes, 
And I yeah. think this, this is such a great idea also to make a picture of the hardware wallet and put it also into the envelope with the other um, uh, descriptions. Yes. Yeah. I, I talk about that a lot in the book as well, about taking pictures. And even uh, another tip that, that's from the book is, you know, if you designate helpers, take a photo of them. And put that in the the packet as well, because your 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 heirs might not know who these people are, That's and it will true, be helpful yeah. for them to have photos of okay, this is the person that I'm mm, talking mm, to, mm. you know, um, and this is what a hardware wallet looks like, and this is what a key looks like, you know, these are the kinds of things. If you're using QR codes, this is what a Bitcoin address looks like, you know, you c you can do all of that. You yeah. can do as much or as little of it as you want. Before we continue our show, a short message from our sponsors. Thanks for listening and we will be back soon. You're looking for a solution to store Bitcoin the safe and easy way? The Card Wallet is a high secure way to storing Bitcoin offline, developed by Confinity and the Austrian State Printing House. The Card Wallet is a professional cold storage solution made with high-quality security materials and tamper-proof features that prevent the manipulation of the card. If you want to know more or buy the Card Wallet, go to www.cardwallet.com. One of my Twitter followers uh, was asking if uh, you think that multisig is a good way for us uh, i say it's i say in the in the private sphere and not in the business or lawyer context um, to use multisig for or here's or do you think uh, is that too technical advanced i i i am a big fan of using multisig uh, for your heirs okay and one of the reasons i don't think it's too advanced and the reason i don't think it's too advanced is because you're already, if they're accessing your crypto assets, it's already too advanced. <laughs> okay. Right? Can, can, you maybe, I mean, can you maybe explain how this would work? Sure. Okay. So let's talk about this. Let, a couple things. So with inheritance planning, there, in my mind, there, there are effectively two phases, right? So you're talking about how are you going to hold your assets while you're alive and hold them securely? And then... You're talking about how will your heirs be able to access those later, but not access them now. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, making a choice to use multisig is not a choice alone for your heirs. In other words, making a choice to use multisig is something that you would do for your own security now. Mm -hmm. It would be something that you would have to, you know, have feel comfortable with. Uh, I also want to just point out quickly, because I don't think we've talked about this, with multi-signature, you don't, that doesn't mean multiple people. You can actually have something called multi-factor multi-sig, meaning that, Anita, you could have a trezor, a ledger, and a, a software key generated from your phone. And that could create a two of three. Okay. In other words, you don't have to have a third party or someone else holding any of the keys. You could own and control all of the keys. Mm -hmm. Does but, that make sense? Yeah, but if someone finds one of my keys, he or she cannot do anything with it. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of people use multisig for their own security now. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, Does it make it more, if you're using multi-signature today for your own security, does that make it more complicated for your heirs to be able to access your multi-signature? And the answer is, as all lawyers do, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we don't tend to give definitive answers. Um, so yes, it's a bit more complicated because your heirs will have to know that you're using multi-signature. Mm -hmm. Meaning that they'll have to know, okay, I need two of these three keys in order to, to unlock these funds. But no, because if they're already at the level of using keys to unlock funds on their own, doing a multisig is not that much more complex today. 
you're already going to have software that you're using. You're already going to have your keys. So what's the difference if they need, you know, two separate keys than one key? From a recovery perspective, it's not that much more complicated. Is it, but is it the same setup as if I do it only for me? Yes. And the reason is because now we're going to get into the nuances of inheritance planning, which I love. Um, okay. So today I'm setting up a multi-signature for myself, a two of three, where I have all three keys. Mm -hmm. When I pass away, my heirs, the helpers and my heirs will have to find two of the three keys and they will come together and that will allow them to move the funds. Now, the question is, where are they going to move the funds, right? Mm -hmm. Are they going to move those funds to an exchange and, and liquidate it and get, you know, th whatever their fiat currency is? Mm -hmm. Are they going to exchange it for something else? Are they going to try to hold those funds? Um, some people really want their heirs to hold their cryptocurrency. In other words, they really want their heirs to just take those keys And while they have access to it, not do anything. Does that make sense? Yeah. But the reality is you cannot control from the grave what your heirs are going to do. Yeah. <laughs> And there's no way for you to anticipate how they will be financially, whether they will be in a financial position to say, okay, yes, I'm just going to leave the crypto where it is, or no, I need to access this. So it's going to be, so the idea of you making a plan for how your heirs are going to hold this if the time comes later is kind of a moot point. I, what is a moot point? I don't know what a moot point is. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it means it, it means it's pointless. There's no, there ah. it's, it's a waste of time uh, yeah, because okay. you cannot, okay. sure. yeah, because you because cannot anticipate, <laughs> You yeah. can't anticipate what they're going to do. Uh -huh. So for you to try to, to not only are you giving them crypto assets, which they probably have no idea what to do with, but now you're going to try to make them hold them securely. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. If they're not interested in doing in, in doing that, the likelihood is that they're going to get hacked or they're going to lose the assets mm -hmm. or they're going to lose the keys. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So better to, to, I think it's better to educate your heirs or your potential heirs about keys and about storage and about crypto assets in a general way so that they'll be more educated when the time comes and they can make decisions mm -hmm. as to what they, they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a lot of people ask me, you know, well, what if I make a multi-sig And I have my cousin have one key and my child have another key and my sister have another key and they're going to hold the funds like that. Mm -hmm. And and my answer is usually, well, you know that they have to agree to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, and so, then it falls mm -hmm. apart <laughs> because, you know, the cousin and, 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 and yeah. your child and the aunt may be in very different financial positions. And so hmm. to try to anticipate that is, is pointless. Much better to focus on your own security now mm -hmm. and making sure that your heirs have the information that they need to unlock the funds and then have a good helper mm -hmm. who can help guide them mm -hmm. through the decision-making process. Okay, mm -hmm. do I want to liquidate? Do I want to hold? How do I want to hold? If I do want to hold, you know, what do I need to do? Give them a hardware wallet as a present, you know? I mean, <laughs> there, there are lots of things that you can do that don't involve you trying to lock your heirs into a decision. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I mean, uh, the fact that uh, it's better that I set up a multisig for myself and explain them then in a letter yes. or something or with a helper uh, how to use it and not give out the keys to my uh, like cousin and uncle. Uh, because what, as you say, I mean, most of the times uh, families quarrel about uh, money if somebody's gone. Yes. So and this will happen, yeah. So yes. um, I see. So then, then the one person maybe which uh, is my next, my partner or my child or whoever can then uh, with this guide 
uh, and with this helper and with the knowledge where the wallet is, where the backup is, um, they then can um, like cash out the fund or do whatever they want with it. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly yeah. right. And I think you brought up a really good point. When you're doing multi-signature for yourself, it actually helps to protect your heirs as well. Because mm -hmm. if one person, if, if all of your funds are locked with one key and one of your heirs has access to that key, you put them in a position <laughs> where they have the power to take all of those assets yeah. and And as you said, you know, ideally, we don't want our heirs, we don't want to think of our heirs as capable of doing something like that. But we also don't want to think of lawyers being capable of doing something like that. And yet it uh -huh. happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. So why put your heirs in a position? Why, why put them in a place where that can happen when you can easily make it so that it can't happen? Great. So I guess... All of this information and many, much, much more is in your book, is it? I mean, which other topics does your book cover? Yeah, so so my book talks about a lot about what we talked about today. Mm. But what, what it is, is it's a step-by-step -step plan. So we start with step one, which is get it done. And that is where you take a few hours of your time and you sit down and you follow the process step-by-step -step And you get something done today. Yeah. You get a plan done today. It's not going to be a perfect plan. It's not going to be the most amazing plan ever written. But it's going to be something. And something is better than nothing when it comes to this. So it's, it's, it's much more important that you have the majority of your funds, you know, uh, available than to have every single airdropped coin that ever existed. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, sure. So, so that's the most important. So it's, the book starts out with get it done. And then after that, I talk about how to make it better. And I talk a lot about security. I talk a lot about where to store your backups, how to store your backups, um, all sorts of tips on how to be more secure now, and then also what you should be thinking about with your heirs, right? So for example, You know, your heirs may or may not decide that they want to hold cryptocurrency. So don't plan for that. You know, things that we talked about. Mm. So we go through each step, how to make your plan better, how to improve it step by step by step. And then we talk about making your plan legal. So what do you need to do? So as I mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation, there are two sides to all inheritance planning with crypto assets. One side is the technical side or the access side. And the other side is the legal side. And you have to have both. So your technical plan must match your legal plan. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a legal problem. Meaning that if you want to give all of your crypto assets to your cousin, but by law, your brother and sister are entitled to them, now... If your cousin, even if your cousin gets, automatically gets the, the crypto assets, <laughs> your brother and sister will be able to sue your cousin and get the value of that back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is this, um, um, is the book written, uh, the legal stuff uh, for US people or do you think that uh, the, the legal parts can also be used worldwide? Um, yes. The so channel. I intentionally, I intentionally wrote the book so that it would be applicable throughout the world. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's that, that said, I am a U.S. lawyer. And so the examples that I give are often based on U.S. law. But what I do in the book is I teach you how to find what the laws are in your jurisdiction. So I give you keywords and I give you ideas on how to search and places where you can find out for yourself without hiring a lawyer, mm -hmm. what the laws are in your jurisdiction. And then if you decide that you want to go down the path of, of, of hiring a lawyer, I talk about how to hire a lawyer. I also talk about how to fire a lawyer. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I talk about, you know, how to find a, a lawyer who's going to work well for you, mm -hmm. who's going to be a good fit for you. And not all lawyers are good fits for everyone. So I talk a lot about that. And then I talk about, finally, in the book, I talk about keeping it fresh. 
So the thing is, is inheritance planning isn't something that you can do today and then leave it for the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you have to keep updating, especially when it comes to your crypto assets. So think about, you know, two years ago, what assets did you have versus today? Um, I'll tell you that you have more. Anyone who had Bitcoin two years ago has more because simply because of airdrops. You have more assets than what you mm-hmm. think. And so you need to, to kind of update those things. And it's not something that's going to take hours and hours of your time. Mm-hmm. You can do a quick update in 15 to 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Most people can do that. And when you do the update, you check, where are my backups? Are they still accessible? Am I still using the same wallets that I was using before? So it actually helps you with your security as well as helping your heirs. Yeah. It's kind of a two for one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm uh, really, it's great. I mean, so much information. We were talking <laughs> now in the last 40 minutes. Um, it's really great. And I think I have to go and set up a multisig and uh, <laughs> make a little <laughs> research. Um, and um, One, one yeah. quick tip, if you're setting up a multisig, and this goes for all new wallets, When you, when you use a wallet for the first time, never send all your money to it. Always send a test transaction, something very small, 20 cents, 50 cents. You know, send something very small and make sure that you can both send and receive. So take your money from your regular wallet, send a tiny bit to your new wallet, and then send it back either to a, another address or a different wallet that you have or whatever, so that you can test the functionality of your wallet before you actually use it. A great tip. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. This was really great. Thank you for this talk and the highly valuable information you gave. Um, I will post the link and uh, to the book and also to the article on Medium. And um, you said there's another article on Medium with this uh, sheet, with the letter. Yes. The letter. I will also I'll, share. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be happy to share the links with you. There yes. are a number. I think I've written um, four or five different articles about estate planning, and they're all free. They're all okay. available to the community. Um, so, And if you like those articles, you can go uh, on Amazon. My book is available on Amazon, and I believe it's also av- available on Amazon.de. Uh, so I've written a number of articles that are all available for free. They're on my websites. They're also available on Medium. And if you like the style and if, if that seems to work for you, you can take a look at the book. My book is available on Amazon. It's on Amazon in audiobook, print, and uh, ebook in the U.S. at Amazon. Also available at Amazon.de. And you can take a quick peek inside the book. There's frequently asked questions there to kind of help you get an idea of whether or not this book is, is going to be helpful for you. Mm-hmm. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us your domain? And are you also on Twitter? And where can we find you? You can find me at empoweredlaw.com, E-M-P-O-W-E-R-E-D-L-A-W.com. You can also find me at Third Key Solutions, which is third key, T-H-I-R-D-K-E-Y dot solutions. Notice it's not com. And you can find me on Twitter at Pamela J-D, P-A-M-E-L-A-W-J-D. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'll be looking forward for any information you, you will send out, you tweet. And um, I wish you all the best for your upcoming work. I think you have some uh, workshops in the next um, weeks. And uh, thank you very much. And I, have a I, good day. I do. Thank, thank you, you so much for having fun. me, Anita. It's been my pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This was today's episode. Thanks for listening. If you liked it, please share it with your friends and family on Twitter or Facebook and leave a review on iTunes or YouTube. And please consider to support the show. You can do several things. You can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash Anita Posh. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N 
facebook.com forward slash a n i t a p o s c h for an amount of five dollars per month you'll get early access to new episodes and a big thank you if you prefer to tip me in bitcoin you can find my address on the website if you want to advertise your product or company please send an email to hello at bitcoincopodcast.com that's hello at bitcoincopodcast.com thanks for listening and have a great day Audio editing and signation spoken by Katrin Eidenhammer. ID and production by Anita Posch. Mm -hmm.